Welcome back to Christian's Colloquy. I'm Christian, and today I'm very, very excited. In this episode today, we are discussing perhaps one of the most interesting figures in church history. Some of you who already read the title and know the name will know exactly why that is, but for those of you who didn't read the title or don't know who that is, I am speaking about today John Bunyan, the author of The Pilgrim's Progress. That is a title that I expect most of my listeners are already familiar with. In case you don't know, The Pilgrim's Progress is probably one of the most influential Christian works out there. Written by John Bunyan, of course, this book is an allegory of the Christian life. And it's one of those books that just really shaped not only English Christianity, English Protestantism, but also the English-speaking world at large. John Bunyan and Pilgrim's Progress is a lot like C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of Narnia. Just one of those works, the author and the work that just really changed the world in a way. Where even in secular universities and their English lit department and classes, they're going to be talking about Bunyan and Pilgrim's Progress. It's just one of those works that dramatically influenced our society as we know it today. I'm going to get into Bunyan, I'm going to talk about his life, some of his works, and why we should be talking about him, but before we get into that, I want to first grab your attention. John Bunyan, while he's remembered as the author of Pilgrim's Progress, let me tell you, he was so much more than that. Not only was he the author of Pilgrim's Progress, as I'm going to talk about later, he wrote so many other influential, powerful works. I'll give you some of those titles later, but just know Pilgrim's Progress wasn't his only allegory. It wasn't his only allegory of the Christian life. He had many other popular allegories. In addition to being a fantastic writer and author, John Bunyan was also a theologian. For the Baptists and evangelical watching, uh, evangelicals watching this, you have to understand that Bunyan was so, so influential to evangelical and Baptist spirituality and practice as we know it today. Without him, I don't know what uh, Baptist and evangelical spirituality and practice would look like. It, it's dramatic, the, the difference he made. Finally, Bunyan also must be remembered and acknowledged as a preacher. This is one of those points that often gets neglected, but it really shouldn't be. To really explain that, let me share with you briefly a a quote. This quote is from the famous and, again, super influential theologian, John Owen. For those who know John Owen, that says enough. But for those who don't know, John Owen was perhaps, and in my opinion, one of the most brilliant theological minds in English church history. Just a titan of theology. Just, I believe some call him the Prince of the Puritans in a way, getting at how he was just like the quintessential Puritan mind, a powerful, powerful figure. And to how that relates to Bunyan is that one day in John Owen's life, as he was in the royal circles interacting with uh, King Charles II, he actually asked King Charles II, or he let King Charles II know that he was going to go listen to Bunyan preach. And in response to that, Charles II, the king, was saying, Why would you, John Owen, the smartest man in my kingdom, one of the greatest theological minds in the world at the time, why would you want to go listen to a guy like John Bunyan? As we're going to talk about later, John Bunyan was of the lowest of classes. He was a tinkerer. He fixed pots and pans as a vocation. Why would John Owen want to go listen to him? Here's what John Owen said in reply. May it please your majesty, if I could possess the tinkerer's abilities to grip men's hearts, I would gladly give in exchange all my learning. Here John Owen is saying he would exchange all of his education, all of his brilliance, all of his learning, his scholastic training and education just to be able to preach like John Bunyan. So again, John Bunyan wasn't just the author of Pilgrim's Progress. He wrote so many works. He was also a powerful theologian that shapes Baptist spirituality. And finally, he was a preacher that preached in such a way that John Owen would give away all of his education and learning just to be able to preach like him. John Bunyan is an amazing, amazing figure. So today, I want to briefly introduce his life. I'm going to 
briefly do that because I encourage you. John Bunyan is one of those figures that if you have a chance, this would be one of the figures you got to read a biography on. You got to go out yourself, get a biography on him, get an audio book, listen to some lectures on him, do some research. So I just want to give you the bare facts so that hopefully you will do that. This, this guy, John Bunyan, he is worth it. With all that said, let me, let me actually do that. Let me give you some facts about who John Bunyan was, his life, where he came from, and let's get a deeper understanding of who the author of Pilgrim's Progress, Progress was. Let's dive in. John Bunyan was born in Elstow, Bedfordshire in 1628 in a town near the city, the present day city of Bedford. Like many Englishmen of his day, Bunyan's initial plan and path was to follow his father's footsteps as a tinkerer, a tinker, a person who would be fixing pots and pans and other tools as a living, just a part of village life. As a teen, however, Bunyan was wild. He was known to be rebellious, vulgar, and all around unchristian in his behavior. But, interestingly, it was around this time during Bunyan's teen years that the Civil War, the English Civil War, was, was fighting, that it was going on during that time. And Bunyan, like many other young men in his town and his area, joined up with the Parliament's army, the Parliamentarian army. And he fought under the command of Oliver Cromwell. I, I should briefly mention that the English Civil War is something that we discussed before on the channel. If you go back, check out the episode on Brilliana Harley, that Puritan mother. And I briefly described the two sides in the, in the English Civil War. How on the one side you had the Royalist fighting for the king and the king's control over the country. Then on the other side you had Cromwell in the Parliament. Those who saw the king as a tyrant and sought to remove him from power. So... There's Bunyan, though. As a young man, he is now fighting in the Parliament's army, and it is during this time that he actually has a near-death experience. I won't go into the, uh, into the account too deeply. Trust me, it's worth it getting the bi biography again. But in this case, I'll briefly say Bunyan was supposed to go out on patrol, he was supposed to stand guard, but for some reason, another soldier volunteered to take his place. And what happened during that time when Bunyan was supposed to be on guard was that there was actually enemies in the area. And the soldier that took Bunyan's place ended up getting shot in the head and killed. This really shook Bunyan and this really was Bunyan's experience of the horrors of war. As a young man, just a teen, he was fighting in this brutal civil war and actually was by all accounts, by human reasoning, it was his place that was supposed to die. Of course, we know God is sovereign and God is at work, but this really shook Bunyan to his core. A few years later, Bunyan would leave the army, and this was in the late 1640s, getting into the 1650s. And it was after leaving the army that Bunyan would marry. And while we don't know the woman's name who Bunyan married, we do know that she was a devout and pious Christian woman, and that she would have a profound influence upon Bunyan. And we could see that over the course of the 1650s as a decade. By the early 1650s, Bunyan was converted, baptized, and became an active member in Bedford's Baptist Church, a Baptist church where he was pastored by John Gifford. By the mid-1650s, Bunyan became known as an amazing preacher. He would preach to large crowds in Bedford, and here is where he attracted the attention of John Owen. So already we could see Bunyan gets married, has this great Christian wife, and shortly after he is converted by God, God probably working through his wife powerfully. Then later on he gets baptized and joins the church. In between there he becomes a deacon at the church. Then only a few short years later he's already preaching to crowds. He's on fire for the gospel and wants to get the good news out to the English people. It continues though. By the late 1650s, Bunyan had launched his career as an author. Not only was he active in his church in a pastoral role, not only was he preaching to crowds in Bedford and the surrounding areas, he eventually becomes this powerful Christian author. In 
and he would write many works in line with the Puritan spirituality of his day. As we discussed in that Brilliana Harley episode, this was a spirituality that was heavily focused upon the role and work of the Holy Spirit, that was heavily committed to scripture, that was heavily invested in the Christian doctrine of salvation, and here Bunyan was fully taking on that spirituality and writing popular books in line with it. This was fantastic. Bunyan, in a short decade, goes from rebellious teen and fighting in a war, has a near-death experience, meets a Christian wife, and then in a decade, he is just on fire for the gospel and being well-regarded for it in his community. Things change, however, in 1660. In 1660, Bunyan's life would totally change, as he, like most other Baptist preachers in his day, was arrested for preaching without a license. In the course of British history, 1660 is that year, is that period when the monarchy was restored. It was gone for a decade or so under Oliver Cromwell, and that was the interregnum period between the kings. But in 1660, the king, his line, is invited back to England. And of course, the king who fought a war and was not thrilled with uh, how his family, how his his people were treated by the Puritans who overthrew him, exacts his revenge. And Baptists were caught up in that. It's important to note here that when you think about Parliament's armies, um, I remember my professor, Dr. Haken, explained how a third of the Parliament's army fighting against the king was made up of Baptists. That Baptists, who were initially pacifists, as I understand it, really took on a militaristic role during this period against the king. So, of course, Baptist preachers like Bunyan, not a good time. Not a good time to be a Baptist. And he was arrested in 1660. But it's important to note that Bunyan's time in prison, he was there for a decade, wasn't a waste. It was during his time in prison that Bunyan began writing many of his most famous works. It's amazing. I I should mention, I'll I'll share some pictures later, but on my trip to England that I mentioned uh, in a previous episode, I got to see the Bunyan Museum, and the Bunyan Museum recreated the prison, what it would have looked like and felt like for Bunyan, and let me tell you, I could not imagine doing much in there, let alone writing best-selling books. Best-selling books are still being discussed and bought and read to this day. But here Bunyan was, in prison for his Baptist convictions, and now writing books while in prison. I should mention that he was released, as I said, after uh, 12 years, but he was arrested again in 1675. Again, he was on fire for God and his word, and he wanted to preach that word, but he was a Baptist, so he was arrested again in 1675. But it was during the second imprisonment for a few years uh, when Bunyan begins writing The Pilgrim's Progress. And it's during that short, shorter imprisonment that he writes the first half of Pilgrim's Progress. For those familiar with the book Pilgrim's Progress, we know that there are, are two distinct sections. But it's in prison where Bunyan writes the first. It's kind of cool now to mention here that while I was in England on this tour, that my professor explained to the the tour group that Pilgrim's Progress, this work written by this imprisoned, low-class Baptist minister, was actually a sign of class in England. That for a long time, until relatively recently, to be a respectable English home, you must have owned and put on display a copy of Pilgrim's Progress. And some of you might just be thinking, oh, that's my Baptist history professor just talking Bunyan up. But on that tour, we had a Unitarian tour guide. Uh, He wasn't selected for his Unitarianism, but he he later on, we asked him what church was he attending, and he said, oh, he's a Unitarian. And he actually affirmed that that was very much the case. And in his circles, that was still very true. Pilgrim's Progress, a work which many of us know today, was actually a sign of respectability in England. If you were to be a respectable English home, a respectable English person, you would have owned and probably read Pilgrim's Progress. That that speaks volumes to Bunyan's influence and the influence of his works. Carrying on. In 
Bunyan would eventually be released in prison in 1677, but he would, upon being released from prison, of course, continue on in his ministry. He would continue on not only as a preacher, but he would be pastoring a local congregation, and he would continue writing. He was actually a prolific writer all the way up to his death. And his death came in 1688, and as I recall from a biography I read, it was a death due to a cold. Uh, as, as we all know and uh, can imagine that getting a cold back in the 17th century, that was, not a, that was not a good time. It was certainly not analogous to us getting colds today, how we just take a, a couple Tylenol or aspirin and get over it. A cold back then was a lot more serious, and that's actually what killed Bunyan. With that short, brief biographical sketch of Bunyan, again, I encourage you, please get a biography on him and read more about him yourself. There are so many fascinating stories in his life and a lot of great encouragement you would get from reading that. But right now, I want to shift gears and talk about some of his works. I want to introduce some of his works so that you better understand the man, his influence, but also so that you might be encouraged to get your hands on some of these books. A lot of them can be found online as PDFs if you just look for them, or they're widely available from Christian publishers or from different publishing houses. So please, I'm going to list some of his works, briefly describe some of them, but I encourage you. If any sound interesting, consider checking them out. The first one, of course, Pilgrim's Progress. That is a profound work, an influential work, as I said, and to give a little description, it is a powerful allegory of a Christian's life, Bunyan's life, our lives, of a person who has converted their Christian life, their spiritual life, all the way up into their glorification, all with the ups and downs that we know and experience in Christian life, put into a very interesting allegory. This book was actually so influential and famous that many people have made profound comments about it. One of the people who commented on Pilgrim's Progress was a man named Augustus Toplady. While you, not, while you might not know his name, Toplady is actually the Anglican pastor behind the hymn Rock of Ages. If you don't know Rock of Ages, I strongly suggest you look it up on YouTube now. Classic hymn of the Christian faith. And here's what its author had to say about Pilgrim's Progress. Top Lady says this, It is a masterpiece of piety and genius, and will, we doubt not, be of standing use to the people of God so long as the sun and moon endure. Here Top Lady is saying, Bunyan's work is so amazing, it is so good and true to the Christian religion and piety that people will continue to read it and benefit from it until the end of the world. And let me tell you, I I think I agree with that statement. People 400 years later are still reading it. I think in 400 years from now, people will still read and get a lot out of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Let's talk about some more of his works though. As I mentioned at the start of the show, Bunyan wrote plenty of other allegories, and two of them really stick out. Those two are The Life and Death of Mr. Badman and The Holy War. Talking about The Holy War for a moment, we have to recognize that in writing this allegory called The Holy War, Bunyan really pulls on from his experience of the horrors of war during the English Civil War. So it has that interesting element of being written by someone who was familiar with bloodshed and death of physical war. But now, of course, he's talking about the spiritual war. So it's interesting how those two worlds come together. And in this allegory, The Holy War, to give the brief uh, overview, Bunyan is talking about this, this battle for the hearts and souls of men. And in this allegory, of course, an allegory being this this uh, this rough sort of description or relation to real events, but allegorized into these characters, again, like Narnia, where Aslan is the allegory of Jesus, and you get uh, the, the kids who are this allegory of humanity. But in the Holy War, you have King Shaddai, who represents God the Father. And King Shaddai is sending his son Emmanuel, of course Emmanuel being Jesus Christ, to reclaim this town named Mansoul from the power of this evil figure named Diabolus. 
Of course, you can see the allegory there. He, uh, Bunyan here is drawing an allegory talking about God the Father sending Jesus Christ to save the souls of his people from enslavement to Satan. A powerful allegory that again draws on Bunyan's experience in war. Definitely worth checking out. But Bunyan has more works. In addition to allegories, Bunyan wrote a few other categories. One, he has a spiritual autobiography of himself, a work called Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. In this, he writes uh, about his spiritual journey in life up until his first imprisonment. Again, he wrote this while in prison, but he describes his upbringing, his conversion, and then his growth in the Christian faith. Definitely an interesting read. As, as I mentioned, Bunyan started off as this rebellious teen, had this war experience, and then marries a Christian woman, and in a short decade becomes this well-known Christian preacher and teacher and writer. So definitely worth checking out his own words, how that happened and what that looked like spiritually. Another work he wrote was, uh, and genre he did was exposition. He exegeted and exposited the text of scripture. One of those is uh, a work called The Acceptable Sacrifice. I believe this is available as a Puritan paperback in that series that many of you are familiar with. And in The Acceptable Sacrifice, this work, John Bunyan provides a beautiful exposition of Psalm 5117. What is Psalm 15, uh, 5117? Let me read that out for you. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. A beautiful verse and a beautiful and challenging psalm. And in this work, Bunyan really unpacks it. Again, worth checking out if you can. Another work to recognize and to briefly describe is John Bunyan's uh, uh, shorter work called I Will Pray With the Spirit. And in this work, Bunyan defends his position against England's, the government's, enforcement of the Book of Common Prayer. Again, this gets into the history and politics of England, but part of the reason why Baptists were imprisoned was because in the 1660s, the Church of England being restored under the monarch and the, the, the Puritans defeated in battle, they enforced the Book of Common Prayer upon the land. The Book of Common Prayer, for those who don't know, is a collection of prayers and services used by the Anglican Church to this day. While the Anglican Church in North America certainly has a few different versions, but it's this book that's supposed to be common to all the churches, where they must follow it throughout their liturgies during the year and uh, their private devotions. Bunyan, in this work, however, I will pray with the Spirit, explains why he rejects the Book of Common Prayer, why he rejects this tradition of enforcing prayer books. Instead, he argues that people should not be bound by these books, which formalize their prayer structure, their liturgies, their services throughout the year. Rather, they should pray with the Spirit. And again, this is a work that really shapes how we understand Baptists and Evangelicals today. Why is there this divide in Christianity and Protestantism between prayer book traditions, formal ritualized worship, and then the more free form and uh, extemporaneous prayer and tradition of evangelicals? A lot of it goes back to John Bunyan in that argument. It's important to note that uh, reading this book, you would see how Bunyan is, is sort of in between what we would imagine these two sides are. While Bunyan rejects the enforcement of prayer books upon the people, He's certainly not totally extemporaneous in the sense that he just prays whatever pops into his mind. John Bunyan's prayers certainly reflect a man who was well-versed in scripture and Christian history and theology. So again, excellent work. I highly suggest you check it out if you want to get a better understanding of how evangelical and Baptist spirituality and practice developed. A lot of it goes back to John Bunyan. That's going to be a theme I'll carry on in a moment, but some of the other works that he, he writes deal with many other theological topics. He has works uh, not only defending his non-conformist position, his rejection of the prayer book and its enforcement, but he also has books against antinomianism, against those people who would say Christians could live however they want. Bunyan has works on Christian life and Christian behavior, how we are to live holy lives and pursue holiness. Bunyan also, interestingly, was also very active in the wider Baptist community. 
I should mention here that calling Bunyan a Baptist can be somewhat controversial. Bunyan has many views that Baptists today would find strange or certainly find to be an odd minority among Baptists. Some of the theological uh, battles he was getting to in his day were with other notable Baptists, Baptist heroes like William Kiffin. Bunyan was very much uh, loose on some issues. He practiced open membership, not making believers baptism a requirement for membership in his church. And he also practiced open communion. You did not have to be baptized as a believer to receive communion. Of course, uh, for some Baptists, uh, that might sound uh, either normal or totally odd, but in Bunyan's day, that was definitely not common for Baptists. Baptists were very much in line with William Kiffin on saying, no, believers' baptism are a requirement for membership, and baptism a requirement for the Lord's Supper. While I find myself on William Kiffin's side in these debates to show my hand a little bit, it's definitely worth reading Bunyan. It, it, it will help you understand how Baptists developed as they did, how Baptists understood these issues historically, and certainly how we got to where we are today. Baptists today practice in a certain way, hold certain convictions, not in a vacuum. We have developed over the years. We have thought about issues and passed along our wisdom throughout the years. And hopefully the next generation and the generation after that will learn from what we have developed, what we have discussed, and what we have articulated today. So again, if you want to get a better understanding of Baptist spirituality, of evangelical practice... John Bunyan is one of those key figures that you got to go back and read. Definitely worth the time. It is now in closing what I want to, that I want to say. Bunyan is certainly an interesting figure. Bunyan is a profound figure. Oh, a figure that really shapes how English Christianity, how the Baptist tradition in particular, really developed over the years. He was a brilliant figure, not only in the sense of his preaching and his pastoral care, but also his writing and influence on that level. And to that end, I want to briefly share how I first really encountered Bunyan. While I grew up reading Pilgrim's Progress with my family, that was certainly a work that I enjoyed as a child, I re-encountered Bunyan in a serious way as an adult. As I mentioned in a previous episode, in 2017, I went on that church history tour to England, and one of those day trips we had was out to the city of Bedford. And what's interesting is when you go to the city uh, town center in Bedford, what you see is this massive monument to John Bunyan. And that really communicates to me, anyway, the significance of Bunyan. When you go to this town, you don't have a political figure at the center. You don't have some person who founded the town. Rather, the town honors and remembers John Bunyan. Bunyan was a figure that left a lasting mark on the cultural, societal development of this region in England. If you go to Bedford, though, there's so much more you can see. There's also Bunyan's church and a Bunyan museum. It's interesting at the Bunyan museum you can see many things about Bunyan but perhaps the most interesting is you can find Bunyan's pulpit. You can see the pulpit he was preaching from. Just a powerful little connection to history where you can get a sense of what preaching and ministry would have looked like for Baptists and for Christians 400 or so years ago. What's even more interesting is that if you go to Bunyan's church today you'll discover a few things. First of all, Bunyan's Church, that chapel there, in today's age, is simultaneously members of the Congregational Association in England and the Baptist Union in England. Like Bunyan himself, who practiced open membership and open communion, the church has maintained that in that they retain membership in the Pado Baptist Congregationalist denomination and the Credo Baptist Baptist denomination. Pretty interesting. But also what you see in that church is that they continue to honor and remember Bunyan. If you look at the doors of the church and the windows of the church, you will see stained glass and carving, talking or pointing to or depicting Pilgrim's Progress. It's interesting that Baptists who are typically opposed to stained glass and fancy carving will embrace carving and stained glass that depicts Pilgrim's Progress. And that's not just Bunyan's church. In Cambridge, we went to, we visited another church, the Church of Robert Robinson, the, the hymnist behind uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And in that church, they also have stained glass depicting uh, Pilgrim's Progress. 
what we see here is that perhaps Baptists have us have these heroes that will make them change their minds or compromise on some of those issues. And while I'm not supporting or against stained glass in this video, I'm not making a statement on that. I'm just saying it's interesting that Baptist churches today will still look back, back to and cherish the work and influence of John Bunyan. That in England, as I learned from this trip, is still very much a part of their culture, of their identity. Even their worship spaces reflect the influence of figures such as John Bunyan. And why do I share that? Why do I make this point? My point is this, that individuals in church history can and do have profound influence that lasts. Whether we recognize it or not, whether we get stained glass portraits of their works or not, we have to recognize that we here today owe so much to figures in our past. Whether we're Baptists, Presbyterians, Dutch Reformed, Lutherans, Anglicans, any evangelical denomination, one way or another, we are influenced by those who came before us, whether we're aware of it or not. And what I want to suggest in this video right now is that it is so much better to be aware of that influence. It's so much better to understand what influences are upon us, where we came from. Instead of just thinking of what we practice today is just what we practice, it is so much better for our spiritual lives, for our church lives, for our Christian lives to understand where we came from, to understand who our influences are. Why? so that we can critically engage with them. We can understand what we do and why we do it in such a way that recognizes that we are not living in a bubble. We are not Christians in a bubble. When we're able to recognize who our influences are, we are able to learn from their wisdom in clear and consistent ways. We are able to actually look at their influence and actually seek to be educated by it. Also, if we're aware of our influences, we're able to critically engage in a way that recognizes their errors. We can look at our practice today and perhaps better understand what we might be doing wrong, what we might not be doing to the best of our ability, if we're aware of where it came from and why it came from there. That's an interesting topic, and I think it's one that I'll have to unpack some more on this channel. The more we're aware of our church history, whether it's early Baptist figures, whether it's medieval theologians, whether it's patristic era figures, the better we understand who they were, what they did, and why they did it, the better we can understand who we are, what we do, and why we do it. That relates to John Bunyan on the practice of evangelical prayer. That relates to John Bunyan and William Kiffin on the Baptist practice of membership and baptism in the Lord's Supper. There are so many more topics like that, but hopefully those give you a brief sample of why church history is important. Hopefully that gives you an understanding of why this channel exists. We today owe so much to the past, and it is so much better for us if we are aware of that influence. Hopefully John Bunyan is an example of that. Anyway, that's it for me today. That's it from Christian's Colloquy today. I hope that this episode was an encouragement to you. I truly hope that you look into John Bunyan, that you seek out a biography of him, that you check out some of his works. Again, in the description down below, I'll have some resources that I recommend you should check out. Please do take the time to check that out. And if you enjoyed this episode, I encourage you, please leave a like, leave a comment, let me know what you learned, ask, ask me questions if you have any, it doesn't have to be related to this show, ask me whatever you got on your mind, I'd love to have a dialogue with you, I would love it if this channel were a dialogue. That's it for today, I look forward to seeing you next Monday with another show here on Christian's Colloquy. Take care.